Hello, this is the second video in my series on Caribbean slavery and the slave trade. This one dealing with the slave trading system and how it functioned. By the 18th century, after several centuries of operation, the Atlantic trade followed well-established procedures. Traders from Europe and the Americas arrived off the African coast with cargoes of suitable goods for trade. These included cloth, iron and copper bars, firearms and gunpowder, alcohol, tobacco, metal goods and baubles. They then exchanged these goods with African traders for slaves, either at European bases established along the coast or more often by cruising along the coast bargaining for slaves in various places as they went. When the ships were full they sailed as quickly as they could to the Americas so as to maximize the number of slaves who survived the journey and so increased profits. Also by the 18th century, the increased demand for slaves meant that the traditional sources of supply, such as debtors and criminals, were insufficient. Hence prices were higher, and the African chiefs and merchants who sold slaves to the Europeans had incentives to collect more slaves, especially young adults and children. This encouraged increased slave raiding, kidnapping, and war. Within individual African societies, the slave trade created divisions between those who benefited from it, rulers and merchants, and those who did not or who were its victims. The sale of European guns as one of the exchange items for slaves facilitated greater violence in capture and eventually destabilized some African societies. As to the process of enslavement, by the 18th century, initial enslavement often took place far inland. Powerful African chiefs and merchants controlled much of the trade. Though intermediary traders were often involved in transporting the slaves to the coast and negotiating with the Europeans. Many of those enslaved were captured in large-scale and very violent slave raids conducted by various African groups at considerable profit. Many others had been kidnapped. Others again had been sentenced to slavery as a judicial punishment or as enemies of more powerful men within their own communities or to pay family debts. Sometimes, in years of famine, large groups of people voluntarily offered themselves for enslavement in exchange for food. Many people died of injury during initial capture or from illness or fatigue during the march to the sea and imprisonment prior to sale. The journey from Africa to the Americas was the middle passage in the traditional triangular trade. After purchase by the Europeans, the slaves were usually branded as a mark of ownership and then tightly crowded onto ships in specially constructed slave decks. The conditions of this journey were normally brutal and vile. The adult male slaves in particular were carefully controlled and shackled to avoid mutiny or suicide, and for much of the voyage to the Americas, the slaves were kept below decks and confined to their narrow berths to prevent escape. Overcrowded in the hope of higher profits for the ship's owners and captains, the slaves suffered greatly, lying painfully in chains and overwhelmed by the noxious atmosphere of human wastes. Food was often spoiled, and there was no fresh water. If the ship was becalmed, there might be no water at all. With stagnant water and lacking adequate sanitation, disease spread easily. Dysentery and scurvy were common. Many died. Overcome with despair and fear of what awaited them, some took their own lives. Dead and dying slaves were thrown overboard, and slave ships were apparently often followed by sharks. All stages of this process were marked by often extreme brutality. Resistance and attempts at escape were common, so those who were newly enslaved were usually tightly bound and chained. Those who would not comply were whipped, beaten, or otherwise tortured. Female slaves were often raped. Despite close surveillance, shipboard mutinies were common. Finally, the slaves reached the Americas, where they were cleaned and prepared for sale to individual owners.
The choice of their future employment depended on the whim of those who purchased them. Most were sold to planters as field slaves, but a minority became house slaves, including some who were taken on to Europe as servants. The house slaves were generally better treated, given better food and accommodation, and therefore were likely to live longer. The field slaves faced a bleak future of unremitting hard work and often savage punishment. With poor food and housing, their life expectancy was normally low. They often faced a lengthy process of seasoning and training following sale as they adapted to their new environment. We will talk about their work in the sugar industry in the next video.